All right, so um, I'm going to make today's session a very short one, maximum 30 minutes. And um, the idea is to teach you what I know you need to be able to do the assignment I gave you yesterday. And then I will add um, a lot more complexity to the assignment so that knowing what you know today, you should be able to um, do something even more complex. And when I finish and there is time, we can take a look at what you have. But I, I tried it. Okay, and is it working? Yeah, it is. It looks like it's working. Okay, then you go ahead and share your screen. Let's see what's there. Okay, um, you'd have to enable me. Okay. Why do I always struggle with changing permissions and stuff on this um, Zoom interface? Security. Screen share. This is not intuitive. Let me see what's going on here. We saw settings or security somewhere here yesterday. Yeah, security. Allow participant to share screen. Okay, now try again. So um, this was our initial system. Yeah. Okay. So the balance of the customers still remains the same, 15,000 mm -hmm. amount. Yes. Um, so I'm just running to, we put in an input to, for the user to enter the amount they want to withdraw. Okay. And if we give, we give, the, we give the, we put in two commands in the system that if, the amount is the amount the user is trying to withdraw is is greater than his balance. It should print. The system should give it. The ATM system should execute this code. Okay. Or else, it should execute the code of his new balance being the amount he wants to withdraw from his initial balance. Okay. And print after withdrawing. This is what you have. After withdrawing so so and so amount your new balance is this, which shows that indeed he has that amount of, he's able to withdraw that amount from his current, his current balance. Yeah. Okay. So your assignment, the assignment posed two questions. That is one, um, to upgrade a program about, to upgrade a program to check for correct next of pin, and two, to block the bank account if user enters pin wrongly three times. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is what I tried my hands on. The I give it, I give the, I give it, um, I created a dummy user pin of one, two, three, four. Okay. Which is an int. And the user pin option, which is also, I use the input to allow the user to enter the pin. So okay. far, yeah. With, uh, well, from the knowledge I have from entering a mount, I, I repeated the same thing with the user trying to enter his pin. So okay. I give the input option to enter his pin. So if user pin is equal to, I use a double equal sign here, I have a mouse here, the double equal sign to show that if the condition on the left is equal to the condition on the right, it should execute this. Okay. Yes, which is, it should allow him to enter the amount he, the user is willing to withdraw. So it brings us back to remaining balance, which is the balance after withdrawing it should, it should let the user know that he's, been, he's withdrawn this amount and his new balance is so, so, and so. Okay. So since we all know that is usually not the case and there are issues of people trying to use other users in, um, to check for security, basically, there should be another condition to state that if the user is trying to withdraw this, if, the, if someone, for instance, steals your card and he's trying to guess the code and he enters it wrongly three times, it shouldn't allow it to. So by that, I'm saying that. Um, this, well, maybe if I'm not, maybe it's a bank account. 
Okay. Um, else, if if, if um, else print pin you entered this incorrect, please check and try again. Okay. But I couldn't do it three times. I didn't know how to do it for three times. That if it continues for three times, it should just break. I didn't know how. To, I've forgotten the break code. So okay. let me just run this for you to see how it works in this case. So this is the user pin. The dummy user pin is one, two, three, four. Please, can you still see? see yeah, I can see. I can see. So one, two, three, four. Enter amount to withdraw. So let's say he wants to he wants to withdraw one fifty one fifty euros. After withdraw one fifty, your new balance is fourteen. Okay. Eight fifty. All right. So let's try incorrectly. Say zero 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 zero. Can you enter this one? Please check and try again. Okay. What, what I realize is you you'd have to if he, it gives it, it gives the uh, the imposter an option to or the user an option to enter the pin more than three times. I couldn't know how to break it up three. Okay. So. All right. I mean, um, this is a good attempt. I like the way you name your variables. I like the way you've structured your like program statement. You have used um, empty lines. Uh, yeah, new lines to break things up, and so it looks nice to read and all that. So that is that is great in terms of um, niceness of variable names and clarity of the code that you've written. However, I'm seeing some problems that I need to address. So um, in cell four, uh, this cell, the the one above what you just ran. I mean, yesterday's code where you said balance is got 15,000 a month, blah, blah, blah. Now, you see that you have already, um, you have already casted the amount into an integer. And yet, when you are calculating remaining balance, you cast balance to an integer and you cast amount into an integer again. Yeah, the it one is I not did. necessary. One it, I like. um, um, it is not necessary because over here, balance is declared as something that stores 15,000. So automatically, at this point in um, the program's runtime, it is an integer. And so there is no need for you to cast it because these things, they add up. Now it is just one line, so it might not um, be a lot of overhead for the processor to do, but they add up. Casting something to an integer takes a processor's time. It has to do certain things and so you don't unnecessarily have to um, be casting things mm -hmm. so um, where you said amount is equal to int input enter amount to withdraw at that point amount is already an integer so you are free to use it in any mathematical expressions without mm -hmm. the need for casting the same applies to balance because you stored fifteen thousand into it if you check the type you will see that um, it is already um, an integer and so the castings are unnecessary and you are doing it in um, this assignment also so over here you cast amounts to an integer and uh, balance is already an integer you are casting it and then um, you're also casting amount again this is the only issue that i have with it so i mean it's it's okay it's okay for now and um after what I'm going to teach you today, you'll be able to do the assignment and um, also the other complex requirements that I'll be adding to it. So you can stop sharing now and um, I'll go on to the task for today. Okay. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. And um, I'm going to create a new notebook. And so um, I will rename this notebook to loops in Python. So loops in Python. Okay. okay. So um, as the name implies, a loop helps you to execute some code multiple times. And uh, we have different types of loops. We have the for loop, we have the while loop, we have a, a different variants of them, which we'll be talking about, but for today, we are focusing on what you can just share. So for today, we are focusing on the for loop and the while loop. And so um, I'm going to start with a for loop. Like you, you showed in your example, the reason why you were not able to 
check if the person has entered a pin wrongly for three times is because you don't um, you are not equipped with the the needed skills to be able to do that let me admit Zina. you are not equipped with the the needed um, knowledge to do that and so after today you should be able to do it now how do you create for loops there are several ways of creating for loops and um, it depends on different use cases and different scenarios but the simplest way of creating a for loop is um, to use the range function before we even go ahead and i show you how to create a for loop yesterday i mentioned um, the fact that there is a data type called list we haven't spoken about it yet but a list is basically just one um, is, is a data structure that helps you to store a lot of values into just one variable. For example, if I want to store the scores that student had in an exam, I can say, let's say 10, 35, 57, 90. If I do this, what makes um, scores a list is the fact that the values are separated by commas and they are enclosed in square brackets. So if I check the type, of scores you see that it will come up telling you that scores is a list so this is what makes it a list and um, the for loop can be used to loop over every item or every entry in the list for example 10 is the first entry in the scores list 35 is the second entry this is the third entry and this is the last entry in it and we have a way by which we can use the for loop to go over it the way to do that is you say four okay and then you come up with um, a variable name so these are scores the list itself is called scores and i am interested in printing every score in the scores list i want you to um, pay particular attention to the phrase i'm using let me check if somebody's joining so i want you to pay particular attention to stephanie you're welcome so I want you to pay particular attention to the phrase that I'm using here. We have this scores variable, which is a list. And um, like I stated earlier, a list is um, a data type that helps you to store multiple values into a single variable. Okay. So, so can you take that line again? Okay, so a list is a data type or a data structure that helps you to store multiple values into a single variable. What that means is, you see the variable here is scores. And up until this point, all the variables we have worked with are only capable of storing just one value. Mm -hmm. But because we are using a list, we are able to store multiple items into it. So now 10, 35, 57, 90, they are all in the scores list okay now let me show you how to assess the individual items because now yes scores is a list it has multiple items in itself the question is how do you assess the individual items the way to assess the individual items is to use their indices indices because it's plural the singular is index so 10 is at index zero the reason is in in computing we count from zero so if you ask me to count from 10, um, if, you want, if you ask me to count 10 times, I will count from zero to nine, which is 10. If you use your fingers and you start counting, and then you point to the first finger and you say zero, by the time you finish using all your fingers, you'll be on your ninth, 10. Uh, meanwhile, you have actually counted 10 times, okay? So the first item is at index zero. The second is at index one. So basically the formula is, to know the index of um, a value in a list, just subtract one from how you normally refer to, to it. Like in normal life, I would say 10 is at first position or index one, 35 is index two, 57 index three, and 90 index four. But in computing, 10 is index zero, index one, index two, and index three. So the way to assess the individual items is, I can say um, first item, is equal to scores you open and close your square bracket and you specify the index so if i specify index zero let me print what's in first item 
You see that first item has 10, right? Yeah. In the same way, if I get the second item, or let, let me just do the last item. So if I do last item, then the last item is at index 0, 1, 2, 3. So I specify index 3. And then I print the last item over here. Now let's run this cell. And you can see that I have access to the last item in there. Let me check if someone is trying to join. Okay, all right. Okay, so we are able to get the last item. You don't necessarily always have to store the items in new variables like I did here. I said first item is equal to scores zero. That was because it's just for demonstration purpose. But if all I am interested in doing is to loop over all the items, I want to um, iterate over all the items, I want to visit all the items in scores, then the for loop um, comes in handy. Before I show you the for loop, let me show you what happens if you try to assess the index that doesn't exist. This is not um, the video about the list, but we need to understand the for loop. We'll have a session where we talk specifically about the list. Okay, so let's say I try to assess the fourth index of score. What happens? Index error, list index out of range. So yesterday I was stressing on the fact that I want you guys to learn how to read error messages, decipher them and know what they mean so that you can attend to errors in your programs. I try to assess index four because I am thinking, okay, this thing has four items. So I should be able to assess index four, which is 90, but that is not the case. In the semantics of Python and in almost every programming language, counting starts from zero. So yes, if you count from one, 90 appears to be on the fourth index. But as far as Python and most programming languages are concerned, it is at the third index because this is index zero. And so I try to assess an index, it doesn't exist. So Python doesn't know what to do with it. It's like I'm asking Python to provide something that doesn't exist. So Instead of giving me something um, useless, it will tell me index error, list index out of range. So once you see list index out of range, it means you are trying to, you have gone out of the bounds of the list. So because it has four items, you can assess the indices between zero and three. If you go beyond three, then you are um, um, stepping out of bounds. You can do negatives. If you do negatives, you are counting from behind. I don't want us to talk um, into details of our list, but see what I can do. I can do negative one and see what happens. Negative one actually gives me the last item. If you are counting from the back, you use negative indices, but that one you count from one because you can't have negative zero. So if I'm counting from the back, 57 is negative two. Let's try that. If I'm, I'm counting from the back, 35 is negative three and then 10 becomes negative four. You get it? Now, let me show you how I can also cause an index out of bounds here. Let me try to assess um, negative five. So you see, you can go out of bounds either on the left side or on the right side. You just need to make sure that the index you are trying to assess is within the bounds of the list. One other function you want to know about is len. If I write len scores, it will give me the number of items in the list. So because scores contains four items, the len return four. The len function doesn't only work on um, list, it also works on strings. So if I want to count how many letters are in my name, let's say my F name is equal to Edward. I can also call the len function on um, my name. So I'll say len F name. And it's going to tell me that there are six characters in my name. If I spell my full name, it was pi, then I get 10. You might be wondering, you see one uh, E, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Why is it 10? Because the space, like I explained to you yesterday, is an unprintable character, but it still requires memory to store it. So the space is actually a character that you don't see. And that is how come my name is made up of 10 characters. In real life, if I ask you to count the number of characters in your name, you will omit the spaces. But in programming, 
it is counted as part of it. So these are some subtle things that you want to be aware of. Okay, so um, enough of the crash course into list. Like I said, this is not a session about list, but we need you to understand how to create for loops. Okay, so now we have scores. We have scores. Let me print it once more so that you know what's in there. So scores contains 10, 35, 57, and 90. If I want to loop over the entire scores list, it is a very simple construct. You just say for, and then you come up with a variable name. Because this is scores, I'll say score, or you can even say S, it doesn't matter. For, for writing for loops, it doesn't matter. You can choose very uh, short variable names and they make sense. So I'll say for score in scores, then I'll print, I'll just print score. Now let me run this and see. You can see that I have looped over all the items and I have printed it in, in order. It is very important. Python will not skip. It will not print 10 and go and print 57 and come and print 90 and 35. No, it is going to print it in the order in which the items are stored in the list. Okay, so look at, I want you to look at this code very well. And then I will say some English phrases to help you um, let this one sink in. So basically what I'm saying is for each score, in the scores list, print that score. Who is confused? If you're confused, unmute yourself and let me um, stress on this. Okay, so I'm going to take the silence as everyone is doing good. Stephanie, are you doing good? Yes. Okay, all right. Rosina, good? Yes, I'm getting it. Perfect. Edward, good? Yes, most. Okay, all right. So just, just try to read the programming statement as phrases in normal English. That is what helps you to make sense. So I said for score in scores, it is the same as for each score in scores. Because um, let's say I've given you uh, work. I've, give, I've handed you a physical piece of paper on which I have recorded the exam scores of all students in my class. Then I tell you to copy them onto another paper. What I'm basically trying to tell you to do is for each score on the paper I've given you, write that score on the new plain sheet that you have. So learn how to read programming statements in plain English so that it helps you to understand um, things properly. Okay, let's do one more example and then I'll show you another way to write a for loop. So um, let's create a fruit list and then I'm going to put fruit in there. Guava, mango, um, popo, um, melon, melon. And then I want to print out every fruit in my fruits list. So what I'm going to do is I'll say for F in fruits. I'm saying F for you to know that you don't have to call it fruit. It doesn't have to be related to the list is just another variable that you use inside the for loop block to refer to the current item that the loop is sitting on. So I will say um, print, and we are going to use the f strings again. So I love, I love f. Now let's print this. So basically, you're telling me I love banana, I love guava, I love mango. I love popo, I love melon. So if you're a bad boy or a bad girl, just create a list of all the names of your boyfriends or girlfriends and look through and see how dirty you are. Okay, all right. So um, this is one way of creating a list. Now let's, 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 let's do some um, playful thing. We know how to use the length function, right? So let's check the length of the spellings of each of these fruits that we have. So I'll say, I love, um, let's say the fruit name and it has, then I'll use F strings again. I'll say learn F characters. So let's run this block and you see, I love banana and it has six characters. I love guava and it has five characters. I love mango and it has five characters. I love popo six. I love melon and it has five. How is this working? So the, the interpreter is going to start from the first item and then it will execute this code, and it doesn't have to be just one line of code. You can include multiple lines of code, like um, unlimited number of codes, which is dependent on 
the logic that you want to implement. Let me check if someone was here. Okay. The logic that you want to implement. So it is not um, set in stone. You are not supposed to just use one statement. You can do a lot more than just writing one statement. So you start from banana and it refers to banana as F. So whenever, wherever it sees the F, don't confuse this F with the F that we need to create um, F strings. In fact, let me make life easier for you. So I'll say FT to stand for fruit. So then you have to change everything to FT. Yeah, so we get that again. So it will take banana and refer to it as FT. So in the um, for loops block, wherever it sees F, it is going to replace that with banana. When it's done with banana, it will go to Gava. It will go to mango, it will go to purple, it will go to melon, and it knows when it has finished, and so it will stop there. Okay, so you know how to um, create a loop by just using this is called the for in loop. For in loop, this is how they write it. So basically, for in, it's called a for in loop. All right, now what if um, you want to? Okay, let's do some more exercise with the scores list, and then I'll come and show you something else. So we have, we still have the scores list here. What if I want to sum um, all the marks that my student obtained? I want to know in total how 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 uh, much did my student score in my exam? It's simple because we have the scores, so all we need to do is to sum them up. The way to do that is you start off by initializing your sum to zero. Because yes, anything plus zero is that thing. So you start from zero. Then I'll say for score in scores, I'll say sum is equal to sum plus s. Now when I oh, go back, sum plus s. Now when I finish, see where I'm doing my printing. I'll come outside the block of the for loop and I'll print um, in total. My student scored, then I'll put the sum there. Okay, let's do this. And you can see that in total, my student scored 192. And indeed, if you sum these guys up, you get 192. And because this is Python and Python is meant to be an expressive language, we didn't actually have to write a for loop to calculate the sum of a list of numbers. I can actually just say total is equal to sum. There is a, an inbuilt function called sum, which takes in a list. So I can just say total is equal to um, int object not callable. Ah, because I have declared sum here. Um, let me let me change this to. So um, you see why choosing variable names is important. I chose sum, and sum is the name of a function in Python. So as long as this session is concerned, my sum has taken precedence over the sum of Python, and so. It, it was using my sum instead of the sum that comes with Python. So I'm changing this to total, I'm changing this to total. Let's go back here. We have 92. And then now, if it sees sum, uh, maybe I need to restart my session because it has memorized that while well, I restart session. Okay, let me just restart the session. Let me run, 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 run this, run that, that. This, that, that. Okay, so now, um, because this is an interactive session, Python, um, the interpreter had replaced the sum with the sum I created. But now I, I named my total so it knows to call the sum that ships with Python. So if I print total, if I print total, I get 192. So you can see that we didn't need to um, create this for loop. But then, um, what happens? Let's combine the if statement we know with a for loop to um, print just, let's say, even numbers. Okay, so let's say um, you have a task and you need to print even numbers from um, zero to hundred. How will you go about doing that? That brings us to the next phase. Now we need to be able to generate numbers, and to generate numbers, you use something known as the range is a function known as the range. Okay, so I'm going to say numbers is equal to range. The way you do it is see, read this um, um, intelligence that comes. Okay, read this um, intelligence. It says range, it returns an object that produces a sequence of integers from start inclusive to stop exclusive. This is what I want you to 
um, get by step. Okay, it's a mouthful, so I'm going to explain this to you. If I create a range, you need to specify the starting point. And by being inclusive, it means it starts from that starting point. And the ending point being exclusive means it hasn't reached there. So if I do um, range zero to 10, what I'm actually going to get is a list of numbers from zero to nine, because the starting um, point zero is inclusive, but the end is exclusive. So it will go one less than what you state. So Stephanie, if I state range zero to 100, what are the list of numbers that I should expect? The zero to 99. Yes, that is correct. Because the 100 is not inclusive, it is exclusive. Okay, all right. Now, it says it generates, let, let's, let's read the intelligence. Um, what, okay, the intelligence is basically what your um, editor or ID, or in this case, Jupyter Notebook, tells you about the function you are calling. So we are calling range. And so this thing that has popped up here, if you hover over the function, this thing that pops up is called an IntelliSense. And uh, I'll show you how to add your own comments to your function so that when people are calling it, they will show up to explain how your function works. So I say, um, it says range. Range um, returns an object that produces a sequence of integers from start to stop. So it says it returns an object. Okay, so now I'm expecting that numbers will contain zero to nine. Let's see something that will surprise us. So if I do numbers, I'm expecting zero to nine. Why am I getting uh, the same thing I typed, range zero to 10? This is a slight difference between Python 3 and Python 2.7. If you are using Python 2, then you actually get a list of numbers. But in Python 3, you have to cast your range to a list to actually get a list. So the way to do that is you cast to a list. The same way you can cast a string to an integer, you can also cast a range to a list. Now, if I do this and I print, you see that now I actually have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So with the example that I gave to Stephanie, if I go to 100, then we are expecting 0 to 99. And indeed, it is so. If I scroll all the way to the end, um, I wanted this session to be 30 minutes, but the way it's going, it looks like we have to go beyond that. So if um, the call ends on the 35th minute, just reconnect and we have the second session. So it goes all the way from zero to 99. Okay, now you can see that the numbers progress with um, 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 increases of one. So from zero to one, to two, to three, to four. What if I'm not interested in numbers that uh, progress by just adding one to them? What if I want it to be in steps of two? So the range function takes a third parameter called the step. By default, it is set to one. That is why we didn't have to state it here. But if I set it to, uh, let's say two, this is too much, let me go to 20, and I'll set the step to two. So what I want is I want a list of numbers between zero and 20 where the, the difference between the, the current number and the next number is always two. So if I do this, you can see that we get the numbers 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 13, um, 16, and 18. So right from this, this simple line can generate the multiplication table of anything you choose. This is just the multiple of uh, multiple mu multiplication table of two. If I want a multiplication table of, let's say three, I can do the same. So three, one, three, three, two, six, three, three, nine, three, four, twelve, three, five, fifteen, three, six, eighteen, and then you can increase it all the way to uh, whatever you are interested in. So um, let's keep it back to two. So this is going to give me um, a list of numbers between zero and something. It will never get to the end because it's exclusive. Remember that, okay? All right, so we know how to do this. You remember um, those days in school where you mess up in class and your teacher asks you to write, I will not make noise in class again, thousand times, depending on which school you went to. If you knew programming it, it will be easier. Those days, unfortunately, we had to take a sheet of paper and write, I will not make noise again. Indeed, a thousand times. But if you knew programming, this is all you have to do. Um, so you say for in range 
let me just keep it to 100 so that I don't disturb your eyes. I won't disturb again. Let's see what happens here. That's it. And problem solved. You've written I won't disturb again 100 times to your teacher in less than um, 10 seconds, thanks to programming. What am I doing here? I said for underscore in range 100. You see the way we did for S in scores? Because we cared about the value of score. We needed the value so that we can do our summation here. In the same way when I was using fruit, I said for FT in fruit because we needed fruit. But if I didn't care about it, I can just use the underscore. The underscore is known as a don't care variable in Python. So if you use the underscore to store something, you're basically telling Python that I don't care about this value. So over here, the reason why I use an underscore is I don't really care about um, the current number. I just want to do something 100 times. What if I wanted to state, let's say the teacher said, write one, I will not disturb again. Two, I will not disturb again. Three, I will not disturb again. Four, I will not disturb again. Then I care about the item. Let's call that item index. So usually we use IX or I to represent index. So I said for index in range 100, print, I won't disturb again. But the teacher said we should state the number. So I'll say F and then over here, I'll use IX and down. Yes, it's a done deal. I won't disturb again. 41, I won't disturb again. 42, I won't disturb again. 43, I won't disturb again. Now let's see some surprising thing. It is starting from zero, but in real life, we don't like, we, we don't want to start from zero. So how do we fix this? The range function helps us to take control of where it starts counting from. So I start from one, because if you don't state the start, it is going to assume that it is zero. So see, the intelligence says start default to zero and stop is omitted, okay? So if I state the start, then it's going to start from there. Let's see. So now it start from, it start from one all the way to another surprise, 99. The teacher asked for 100. So how do we fix this? We know that the last item you state is exclusive. And so I go to 101 so that it will do from one to one less than 101. And if I print this, now we get 100. And if I scroll up, it indeed started from one. So this is one way of looping. And this is what you needed to be able to um, solve the, the assignment that I gave you yesterday, which I'm going to add more complexity because I have shown you how to use for loops today. Let's do one more um, example with the for loops before we move on to the for loops. Okay, so um, let's use scores again. So our scores is still in memory, and indeed it is so 10, 35, 57, and 90. What if we want to calculate the average? I want to know the average score of the students in my class. 